another day of worship, another day of learning, another day of empowerment, another day of enrichment, another day of elevation, another day of equipping on this pathway to heaven. Oh Lord, that which we don't know, teach us. Amen. That which we have forgotten, remind us. Amen. Help us to be doers of your word continually in Jesus' name. Amen. And help us to make ourselves ready when the rapture happens in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep us feet for your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, because we know you've answered. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. We thank God for last week we spoke about be ye holy for those who were on at the service. And we looked at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, as well as Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44, 44 and 45. And we saw that God's requirement, whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, they are the same. Be ye holy, for I your father, I am holy. And we saw the command to be holy. Why did God give that command? He gave the command because if we are children of God, we need to reflect the character of God. The command has been given because without holiness and purity, we cannot see the Lord. The command was given because we can only relate with God on the basis of holiness. There is no other basis to relate with God. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. God is too righteous to behold iniquity. If you are going to bear the vessels of the Lord, you need to come clean, come pure. The Bible says that if a man will purge himself from all these kind of pollutions, it is only him that can be a vessel unto honor unto God meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. So if we're going to live with God, relate with God, serve God, we can only do it on the basis of holiness. But not only that, you want to receive empowerment from God, deliverance from God, assistance from God. The Bible says the Lord your God walketh in the midst of you to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore shall your camp be holy that he sees no unclean thing in that camp, and then it disappears. Joshua told the children of Israel, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders amongst you. The sanctification must come before the wonders. Without the sanctification, the wonders, wonders will never arrive. So those were the four reasons for the command to be holy. And then we saw the criteria for holiness. And I told you that Holiness is a second work of grace, subsequent to the first work of grace, which is salvation. Sanctification follows salvation. So it's an experience for somebody who is already saved. If you are not saved, then you need to be saved before you can now say, okay, Lord, I've been saved now. I want to experience I mean, sanctification. Salvation is to deal with our sin. Sanctification is to deal with inward depravity. Salvation is to deal with the shoots of sin. Sanctification is to deal with the roots of sin. One is the works of flesh. The other one is the thoughts of the heart. And I showed you that when the Bible talks about salvation, it talks about clean hands. But when the Bible talks about sanctification, it talks about pure heart. And you need the two. Who is going to ascend to the holy hill of God he that has clean hands and a pure heart. Both are essential to be able to eventually get to heaven. And we also saw that, you know, somebody who has been saved, have you gotten rid of every form of worldliness in your life? Because if you, if you have not, sanctification is difficult. If you have not gotten rid of worldliness in your life, where are you going? If you, have, if you allow worldliness to eat you up, you'll be unfruitful. 
God cannot count you as a friend. I mean, friendship with the world is enmity against God. So if you say you are saved and you want to come and receive and they seek sanctification, you must be rid of all forms of worldliness. And I told you that worldliness is more than what most people understand it to be. Worldliness can be very subtle. I told you last week, if showmanship increases and sobriety decreases, worldliness has taken over that kind of a life. You want to show off your dress, you want to show off your this, you want to show off that, no more soberness, no more, no, just somebody who, who is very low profile. When haughtiness, like the daughters of Zion, increases, walking and missing with their hands and, the, you know, I read it to you in Isaiah chapter 3, and you find that humility has decreased. It's an evidence that worldliness has taken over that life. When sensuality increases and spirituality decreases, holiness has taken over. When carnality is the order of the day, and for Paul and for Apollos, and Paul said, are you not carnal and walk as ordinary men who have never experienced grace? When feasting increases and fasting decreases, brother, we see you everywhere. That one is doing a naming ceremony. You are the chairman. The other person is doing, you know, uh, songs of service for the funeral of his late father. You are the chairman. And somebody is doing wedding. You are the MC. All the societal functions, you are number one. Feasting all around. But when we say praying and fasting, saying, I don't know, pastor, you know, this is my stomach. <laughs> Your stomach doesn't mind food, but it, man, it minds fasting. Holiness is taking over your life. When feasting increases and fasting decreases, worldliness is taking over. When classiness increases and you can no longer condescend to men of low estate, you look at your education and you look at people around you, say, well, I am a graduate. This one didn't even go to school. Paul was a graduate. He studied under Gamaliel. But Peter was an illiterate. Both of them were still apostles. When classiness increases and we can no longer condescend to men of low estate and we feel we're in a class by ourselves, those people we cannot mix. I read it to you in Romans chapter 12. I showed you in James chapter 2 when the Bible says rich man comes, there's a way you treat him. A poor man comes, you treat him another way. And the Bible says, are you not partial? Did no rich men crucify you? Did they not abuse the name by which you are named? Why are you giving them preference over the poor? Has not God chosen the weak things of this world to confound the wise? You know, when we, we, we think that, you know, we are so educated, we are so rich, we cannot identify with some people, what has taken over your life? As a believer, you don't understand. When self increases and the Savior decreases in your life, worldliness has taken over. John the Baptist said, I must decrease. He must increase. If your own is the reverse, that I is increasing and the Savior is decreasing, worldliness has taken over your life. When fashion increases and faith decreases, God is telling you the way you should dress as a believer. But what the world is going to say matters more to you than what God is going to say. You must, the latest fashion. Maybe before you were born again, people knew you for fashion. Now you are born again. You still want to, to you still want them to know that even though I'm born again, no, I'm still the champion of fashion in this arena. But worldliness has taken over your life. You are not living for Christ. You are not living for Christ. The Bible says in that he died for, for all, that they which live should no longer live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Henceforth, don't live for yourself. Live for the Savior. Don't live for fashion. Live for the Savior. Be proud. You know, many times I wonder, you see all these Hollywood artists, some of them would be almost barely naked, almost completely naked, and they are so proud, you know, on the television, on the, on the media, and they are gathering followers. 
And then we, we which, who, who are decent, you know, who are chaste, we feel ashamed of the dressing we are, we are wearing. How should you be ashamed? They should be feeling ashamed. We are not animals. And sometimes they dress as if they are animals. They say red carpet. Red carpet is nakedness. And, and, and they are promoting that. We should show chastity and be proud that we are human beings having some, some, science, um, some, some sense of decorum and decency. Most of those people, they've lost all forms of decency. And then we are trying to be apologetic. Apologetic for what? We are the ones in the right. The world has gone astray. Why do you want to follow the fashion of the world that passes away? But when fashion increases in your life and faith and faithfulness decreases, it's an evidence what goodness has taken over your life. And you don't even realize it. I pray the Lord himself will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. I told you that if you want to be sanctified, you need to task for righteousness. Because the Bible says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. They are the ones that will be filled. Any other thing is going to be difficult. Then you consecrate yourself. Who have I in heaven body? Who have I on earth or, or, except me? You, 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 you are panting after God like the earth is panting after the water brooks. You are chasing God like no man's business and saying, God, you are my all in all. When I have you, I have all. If I don't have you and I have every other thing, it is nothing. You are chasing after God. Then you are ready. And then you should approach it, approach God, the throne of grace by faith and experience it. Because sanctification is the work of God. We can consecrate, we can come in faith, we can task for righteousness, we have gotten rid of, I mean, of, uh, you know, of uh, worldliness, but the surgical work in our heart, the circumcision of the heart, it is God that does it, and it's, it's a work that no man can do. So you need to, to come unto him, and the Bible says, the very God of peace sanctify you holy. He will do it. It is the work of God. And when you approach him in the right way, he will do it. Peter told, I mean, uh, uh, James, I mean, Peter told us that God purified their hearts by faith. Speaking about the people in the house of Cornelius, that God purified their hearts by faith. And God also, he will purify your heart by faith. Amen. The fact that it's important for you to continue in holiness, continuance in holiness. That let, don't let your holiness be spoken in the past tense. The Bible says for of Israel, righteousness lodged in the past tense in it. In the past tense, this was a nation that, I mean, that was faithful and holy. Their holiness was spoken of in the past tense. That is, in the present, they've gone astray, they are filled. In. Let your righteousness, let your holiness, let it be a continual thing. Until Jesus comes, I pray the Lord Himself will do it in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. The message last week on believe holy. Today we are looking at the message, the believer's sanctification. In First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians in chapter four, I read verses three and four. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses three and four. For this is the will of God. And I'm asking myself, what is the will of God? That's what to do. If I can discover the will of God, that's what I want to go for. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Know how to possess your body in sanctification and honor. So as to know how to preserve your soul in sanctification and honor. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. So as we are talking about the believer's sanctification, you should understand that it is the will and the priority of God as I've read to you in that passage, the Christian experience does not terminate at salvation. Salvation is in fact 
the beginning of the Christian experience. Sanctification is subsequent to salvation. It is a logical follow-up to salvation in the ladder of Christian experience. Even when we are sanctified, it's not the end. We are climbing the ladder. But you start from somewhere. After salvation, you climb up to sanctification and then onto other experiences. The believer's sanctification. And you know, in the Christian dog, there are so many, I mean, this Past this, uh, on, I mean, sanctification. That's why I'm doing this topic today, a, a follow up topic, because there is a lot of misunderstanding in the kingdom about this sanctification. Many people don't understand it. Some Christian groups that believe sanctification is one thing they believe, not another thing. But you find there are so many, but very many times what is happening is that some hold on to a little bit of, of one and a little bit of the other but it is the totality and I want to show you all the totality in the scriptures and show you the ultimate because number one, sanctification can come through the Holy scriptures but show me somebody who is always reading and studying the Bible I will show you somebody who will experience, you know, some sort of separation unto God, some sort of sanctification, some sort of, you know, more closeness to God. It is normal. If you read the Bible a lot, if you study the Bible a lot every time, as we read and study the scriptures, there is a measure of sanctification from the word, not from the world, that says world, that else should be out in the outline, from the world that we experience as we obey the injunction of the scriptures. Look at what Jesus Christ said in John chapter 17, verse 17. John chapter 17, verse 17. The Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Christ is saying here, sanctification can come through the truth. Sanctification can come through the word. It is through which we understand even sanctification itself. But even by itself, there is a power in the world that sanctifies in some measure. We need to understand that. As we dip in the world constantly and consistently, we get cleaner. Even when we do not retain the totality of what we have read. Can you look up? You know, we do this one when I was young. Sometimes we go to the, to the farm and there is a basket. We have used it to carry, you know, cocoa. When they, they crack cocoa and, and then the parts of the cocoa and then you carry it and you go and throw it on the, you know, where it's going to dry. Many things, some of that, you know, thing are out of the cocoa pot is going to stick to the basket very many times. By the time you finish the day, the basket is a little bit dirty with those things. And you can't, you, you can't, you, you can't remove it. It's difficult. So what do we do? We go to the river. We want to clean the basket. We go to the river. And what do we do? You take the basket, you put it in the water, you raise it up. You put it in the water, you raise it up. Every time you put the basket in the river and you take it out, that basket does not retain water at all. But by the time you do that for about 10, 15 times, the basket is cleaner. All those things that have attached to the basket from the cocoa, as you put the basket in the water and you remove it, you understand? They yes, remove sir. it. And the basket will be cleaner. By the time you have done that many times, and that's a technique we use in the, in the farm. The same way, as you dip in the water, as you dip in the world, and you come out, you dip in the world, and you come out, you dip in the world, and you come out. You may not even retain, I mean, much. Just like that basket does not retain the water, but the basket gets cleaner every single time. The same way, reading the word, studying the word, immersing yourself in the word, there is a measure of cleanliness and sanctification that you experience just as a result of that. And Christ said, Look, sanctify them through the truth. 
thy word is truth. So just like a dirty basket, he must and withdrawn from water a hundred times will get cleaner, although it does not retain much water. You know, some brethren will say, well, Pastor, even what I'm reading, I, I don't remember. Don't worry. You'll be getting cleaner. Amen. You'll be getting holier. Amen. You'll be getting closer to God. Amen. It doesn't matter that you don't retain all the things you are reading. Just read it. Just read it. Just understand it. Just keep on reading. Just keep on studying. There's a measure of impact upon your life that you don't understand. Just like that basket does not retain water, but it's going to get cleaner anyway at, at the end of the day as you immerse it inside that water. As you immerse yourself in the world, there is a measure also that you're going to be, it doesn't seem so, but it is so. And we need to understand that. John chapter 15. Let, let's read. John chapter 15. I read from verse 3. Now, you are clean. How? Through the word. Through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. But I want you to see that Christ said, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. As you dip into that word and Christ is speaking into you, unto you, there is a measure of cleanliness that you are going to be experiencing. The word sanctifies. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I read verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. He's talking about Jesus. If I read from verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. When Christ loved the church, what did he do? And, and gave, gave himself him for it. He sacrificed himself for the church. For what reason? Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. By how? By the word. By the word. That he might sanctify the church with the washing of water by the word. There is a measure of sanctification that you receive in that way. And it was John Bunyan that said, the Bible will take you away from sin. Or sin will take you away from the Bible. It, it, the two of, the, of them, they do, not, they, do not, they do not mix. You know, if you see somebody that is coming to church, every time the message is preached, if you are doing something bad, there's conviction. And if you want to get to heaven, what do you do? You practice. You, you stop that practice. You know, your life gets better. That's what happens. And the people that don't want, I say every time I come, I mean, I feel guilty. Either they stop coming to church and eventually they are no longer hearing the word. And John Boyer, he said, either the Bible will take you away from sin or sin will take you away from the Bible. That's the process whereby the sanctification occurs. Because as you read the Bible, it takes you away from sin. You cannot be comfortable in sin. You cannot be comfortable in iniquity. Your life gets cleaner and cleaner. The more truth you get, the better your Christian life becomes. Because what you did yesterday because of ignorance, as you come today and you understand, you abandon it. You are better. And that's what happens. And sanctification comes in this area. The word of God is powerful. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows. And it is a discerner of the thoughts 
and the intents of where? Of the heart. Of, of the heart. That's what the word does. The word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The psalmist said, your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. The word of God, it keeps the righteous, it keeps us righteous and sanctified. The Bible says, in the keeping of God's word, not only that there is great reward, it is what keeps us from sin. In Psalm 119, verses 9 to 11. Look at what the scripture says. Psalm 119, verses 9 to 11. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. Thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word of God will not make you to wander. It gets you closer. It keeps you on the righteous way. You hide it in your heart, sin disappears. So show me a believer that is not reading the Bible. And show me another believer that is constantly reading and studying the Bible. I show you a believer that is holier. The one that is dipping in the word constantly, consistently reading the Bible, you know, studying the Bible. There is a measure of sanctification. There's a measure of cleanliness in his life that the word affects in his life. And that's the truth. Sanctification through devouring the scriptures. That's one. Now, is this the all? You remember what Jeremiah said? Is not my word like as of a fire? What does it do? Like a, a fire that burns off. It burns, burns off. Burns burns off. Burns burns off. Out of your life. Just the word. It's like a fire. Refining fire. Burns every kind of worldliness, burns every kind of ungodliness, burns everything that you know a tendency, you know, to evil. The word is like a fire, burns it out, and you experience a measure of sanctification. Now, there are some Christian assemblies that believe in sanctification, and this is all they believe, and they are not wrong. But this is only part of the truth, amen. Amen. That's the problem. You know, it's like we have four things and you only believe one. You are right, but you are not totally right. Somebody met one day some three blind men. And the three blind men, they took the three blind men to somewhere. Each one was meant to feel something different. And then afterwards, they were meant to describe what they felt. And then A said, I'm the one that is right. B said, I'm the one that is right. C said, I'm the one that is right. And they began to fight. And they said, okay, A, what did you feel? A said, what I felt is, like, is it looks like a trumpet, something that you can blow. I, can't, I didn't see it, all, but that's what I felt, all right? The other one said, what I felt is like a, a, a thick rope, very, very thick. He said, all right. How about the third one? He said, the thing is very thick. It's like a wall, very, very thick all around, like a wall. Do you know what has happened? All of them were right, but none of them was totally right. They took the three of them to an elephant. One was meant to feel you know, the tusk of the elephant. And he described what, is, what he felt, which is like a trumpet. Is that not so? Yes, sir. The other one was meant to touch the tail of the elephant. And he said, what I felt, oh, this is like a thick rope. Is it not correct? Yes, sir. It's correct. The other one was meant to touch the body of the elephant. And he said, it is very thick, like a wall. Is it not correct? Correct, sir. Now, which one of them is correct? Totally correct. None of them, sir. And they were fighting. That's the problem many times in the church. The people that believe that they are right, 
but not totally right. They've only taken just one part of the truth and believed it. And they've neglected the other parts and it creates a problem. And sometimes when we meet, they say, no, 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 you have believed false doctrine. He has not believed false doctrine. It's true doctrine. Only that is only part he has believed, which is not right. So what I've talked about now, there are some Christian assemblies. That's all they believe about sanctification. That if you read the Bible, if you read it very well, if you study it day and night, you will be sanctified. And they are right. Sanctification comes through the following scriptures. But it's only part of the story. Amen. Amen. So you are beginning to understand the total impact of it. And it's important that any truth of scriptures, you must understand every bit of it. Don't just take one bit and run away. You will be lopsided. You will be, it is the truth, but it's not the total truth. It is the total truth that can make you free. Half truth does you no good. Amen. So Amen. Sanctification through the very scriptures I've shown you, and it is Christ said, You are clean through the words I've spoken unto you. The word of God is fire, it can refine you. I've shown you in the scriptures that you know Christ said he will sanctify and cleanse the church by the wash with the washing of water by the word. Sanctification through the word, through the very scriptures that comes. But let's look at the second point: sanctification through deliberate separation. That's another way. Sanctification is a word that is used in the Bible in the, in the sense of setting something apart for a holy use. When you take, let's say, a cup, and then you say, from today, this cup is going to be used in the service of God alone. Nobody must ever use it to drink water. Nobody must ever use it to do any other thing. This cup is used, going to be used for the service of God alone. You have sanctified that cup. You have set it apart for an only use. And the Bible talks about sanctification in that context also in the Bible. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. So we're talking about sanctification through deliberate separation. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Joshua told the children of Israel, and Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. You cannot sanctify your heart the way God will sanctify it, but you can sanctify yourself in the way God expects you to sanctify yourself. This is talking about set yourself apart. Remove yourself from every form of filthiness and uncleanness. Fornication is unclean. Let it not be once named among saints, among you as becoming saints. Separate yourself from that kind of defiling influence. That's sanctification. Sanctification through deliberate separation. That's also sanctification. You are setting yourself apart for a holy use. You are setting yourself apart from God. When we separate ourselves from every defining, defiling influence and we set up ourselves apart unto God, it is a form of sanctification. Let me show you that. It's 1 Samuel chapter 21. Many people never see this, but let me show you. 1 Samuel, please open with me. Open with me so that you understand the usage of the word and what the Bible is saying. 1 Samuel chapter 21 in verse... 23. Now, this was when David was running away when Saul wanted to kill him. And then he had some men with him and they were hungry. And then they came to the priests. And in verse 3, now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand. Or, what there is present? David said, priest, high priest, we are hungry. We don't want to die. Do you have bread? Give us. Or what else do you have that we can eat? Give it unto us. See the reply of the priest in verse 4. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread. What he's saying is that the bread you buy from the factory or from the bakery and you eat, I don't have that kind of bread. 
The bread I have here is bread that has been consecrated for holy use. Hallowed bread. Holy bread. It was baked like other bread, but now it has been consecrated for divine use. And only holy people can eat that bread. I don't have common bread. I only have hallowed bread. Then he said, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. Did you hear that? Yes, sir. He said, this holy bread, because it has been consecrated, is no longer common bread. Mm. Only people are the only ones that can eat it. If you can assure me that these ones have sanctified themselves, they've kept themselves away. They've kept themselves from immorality. They've kept themselves from fornication. They've kept themselves from women. Then I can give you the holy bread to eat. Do you understand the, the story? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look at what David said. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days. So he's even saying that even those of us who are married, we have not come across our wives for the next, last three days. We have, you know, we have stayed, you know, away from sex, even married sex. Say so for these three days, our vessel have been, you know, holy. Even those of us who are married, we've not even touched our wives. You understand? In verse, mm. in verse uh, 5, And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy. Holy, holy in that God has sanctified them? No. Mm -hmm. Holy in the sense that they are separated. The deliberate separation so David said, in these three days, even those of us who are even married, I mean, we're not talking about immorality here now, a married person, that's legal. He said, but even those of us who are married, for these three days, remember that the, the people of David, many of them were married. You remember him in 1 Samuel chapter 30 in Ziglag, when their children, their, you know, their children, their wives have been carried away. They were married men. But David is saying that even in these three days, we have been separate. We have separated ourselves. We are holy. And then he said, the vessels of the young men are holy. And the bread is in a manner common. Yeah. So it was sanctified this day in the vessel. So he said, we are just like the priests. We are holy. So if you give us the holy bread, you will not be sinning. Do, does it help you to understand what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. These men have been separated from women. They've had no sex. So in that respect, their vessels are holy. So we're talking about sanctification through great separation. So these men are holy. Holy in the sense that they've kept themselves away from this kind of activity. So when you dedicate something to an holy use, that also is called sanctification. And when Joshua told the children of Israel, sanctify yourself. For tomorrow the Lord is, will do wonder. He's telling them any kind of thing that will make God not to do wonders among you, go away from it. Any kind of defilement, any kind of uncleanness, any kind, separate yourself from it. And the children of Israel can do that. You can separate yourself from uncleanness. Look at First Thessalonians that we read when we started. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Because we, this message is a bit technical, but it's, it's important because we need to understand what we believe. We need to understand how things work. Many of us, our understanding of the scriptures is too modeled up, and it must not be. There must be clarity. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Let me read to you again from verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should what? Abstain from fornication. From from fornication. That's a form of sanctification. Abstaining, separating yourself, deliberate separation from anything that can defile you is also sanctification. And then here it says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. The vessels of the young men are holy. Why? They knew how to possess that vessel in sanctification and honor, separated from every form of defilement. 
They knew how to do that. And because of that, the Bible says, and David told the priest and said, in fact, I can testify that the vessels of this man, they are holy. For the past three days, you no, know, they've had nothing of that. He's not even talking about fornication. These were married men and uh, having a relationship with their, with their, with their wives is normal. Mm -hmm. That's why the Bible says, for example, when you want to fast, what do you do? You tell your partner, please allow me so that I can fast because you are dedicating yourself to an only purpose. And in that period, you keep yourself away from that. And you don't want to defraud your partner. You don't want to say hey, every time you will be using fasting even to, to, to rob me. That will be defrauding. You say it's with agreement. But you can understand that. You are dedicating yourself for a holy service. Whether it's one hour, whether it's half a day, whether it's one day fasting, what the Bible says, you do it with the consent of your wife. It's a kind of sanctification so that you can fast. So se deliberate separation is sanctification. And you can experience sanctification through that in uh, for Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Let's read the scriptures because it's important for us to understand this. That, that's why as a pastor, you know, I like this kind of messages that makes things to be clear. Not that we are just using a word, we are using a term. We don't even understand it. Our understanding is bottled up. Uh, are we going to be able to even enjoy the benefits of that experience when we don't even understand the experience? So, 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of art, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from this, not God purging you, you purging yourself. If a man therefore purge himself from these things, from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. If a person will separate himself from these polluting and defiling influences, then he will be a dedicated vessel that God can use, a vessel of honor. That's sanctification. Here it tells you again that if you purge yourself from this, you will be a vessel unto honor and you will be sanctified and meet for the master's use. You will be, you, God will reckon that, okay, this is a vessel of honor that I can use because he has separated himself from every form of polluting influence. That's sanctification. So we're talking about sanctification through deliberate separation. When we separate ourselves from every defiling influence and we set ourselves apart unto God, it is a form of sanctification. And God, the Bible says so. You need to understand that the Bible says so. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You know the Nazarites? In fact, before the second Corinthians, let's go to Numbers chapter 6. Let me read it to you. Numbers chapter 6, because it's important. Numbers chapter 6, from verse 1. Numbers chapter 6, from verse 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. So they are vowing the vow of the Nazarites. What are they doing? To separate themselves unto the Lord. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat mosting grapes or dried all the day of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the earth all the days of the vow of his separation shall there shall no razor there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in which he separated himself unto the lord he shall be holy he shall be holy 
and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come no, at no dead body. Now, this is the, let, let's just stop there. This is the consecration of the Nazarites. They are sanctified unto the Lord. And God says, in order for you to be sanctified unto me as a Nazarite, these are the conditions. You don't drink wine. You don't drink hot drink. You don't touch dead body. You don't cut your hair. And they do that because they are separated unto the Lord. And the Bible says, in the sense in which he keeps all that, he is holy. Sanctification through deliberate separation. Very important. Second Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things, no, sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Not God cleansing you this time now. Let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There, this is what you do. This is a separation you do. God is not going to keep the Nazarite from wine. He must keep himself from wine. He must keep himself from strong drink. That was part of the problem of Samson. Samson was a Nazarite. Read it in Judges chapter 13. Then he killed a lion. The lion was now dead. Then beasts formed something inside the lion. And one time, Samson was going and he went to go and eat honey from you know, the, the honey that the beasts have created inside the dead lion. That's violating his calling. That's part of the beginning of the problem of Samson. He's forgotten he was a Nazarite. Other people could have done that and it doesn't matter. But you are a Nazarite from the womb. You know that you shouldn't do that. That lion is dead. You shouldn't touch it. Amen? Amen. So, separation, sanctification through deliberate separation, that's another. And you know, again, like I said the other time, that some group of Christians, that's what they believe sanctification to be. And you find that a lot of the, you know, holiness of the Puritan fathers, was like this. They were very strict. They were very, you know, people that they don't come across sin or defilement. Very strict when it comes to Christian life. You won't see them, you know, in any questionable activity. They know how to separate themselves from every kind of defiling influence. And their sanctification was of this. Are they wrong? No. They are right. But this is only part of the story. That's what I'm saying. So people believe sanctification through devouring scriptures and it is right. And that's the only thing they believe. It's half the story. Some people believe sanctification through deliberate separation. Are they wrong? No. They are right. But it's only part of the story. It's not total, total of the story. Show me a believer that is very careful. Show me a believer that deliberately separates himself from every form of defiling influence and is and devouring the scriptures, you will see a believer that is very going to be very close to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Buy number one and buy with number two in your <laughs> life. We have not come to the ultimate. In fact, already you have left many believers I mean, apart. In fact, when people look at your life, they say, this brother is an angel. He's not an angel yet. <laughs> He's not even near to but already implementing number one, number two, he has gone very far. It's part of the story. I pray the Lord himself to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Number three, there are some people also, sanctification through devotional, devotional strategies. Oh, what do I mean? We experience a measure of sanctification as, let me ask you this question. If you have ever fasted, if you start to fast and you decide to fast for two days, you fast for one day and you pray, you fast for the second day and you pray, by the time you are breaking that fasting, 
Spiritually, how do you feel? You feel closer to God? You feel, you know, as if, you know, you are nearer to heaven? It's a form of sanctification. Some of the cares of the world have dropped off your life. You are more focused on God. The flesh has been subdued. The spirit is having the ascendancy. And you feel on top, you know, spiritually. It's a form of sanctification. That's sanctification through devotional strategies. And some people, that's what they do. We experience a measure of sanctification as we draw closer to God in devotion. We feel a closeness with the Almighty and a detachment from the things of the world. Our spirit is lost in divine wonder and we inhabit another spiritual plane. You, you just get to another plane completely. Believers who fast often and who pray much, they experience this kind of sanctification. They experience brokenness. They experience a submissiveness to the will of God. The flesh is crucified. The spirit gains ascendancy and they feel a measure of sanctification, a measure of separation unto holy use, a measure of closeness unto God. It's a kind of a sanctification, but through devotional strategies. When the psalmist said, like the heart pants after the water brooks, so my heart pants after you, O God. That's the kind of thing you are going to, you are going to experience when the the, the uh, the people in Isaiah, when they were saying, we have been fasting, God is not taking any knowledge, we have been afflicting our souls, and God is not, they expect closeness to God as a result of their fasting, and they are saying, but it's not happening. And God said, because you have not left sin, you are still oppressing people. You move fast this day. If you fast in sin, there will be no result. I won't come close to you. But you could see what they are talking about. It's as a result of you know, the fasting, devotional strategies, that's what it does. They that wait upon the Lord, they renew their strength. strength. You fast, you pray, you renew your strength. You mount up with wings like the eagles. You walk, you are not weary. You run, you are not tired. It's a kind of sanctification that comes through devotional strategies. That also is another. In Job chapter 22, let's read a few passages so that I can be able to show you. And Job chapter 22 from verse 26. Job 22 from verse 26. For then shall thou, the, shall thou have the, thy delight in the Almighty and shall lift up thy face unto God. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him and he shall hear thee. And thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. And the light shall shine upon thy ways. When men are cast down, then sh thou, shalt, thou shalt say, there is a lifting up, and it shall save the humble person. It shall deliver the island of the innocent, and it is delivered by the pureness of thine hands. As you come close to God, you experience that. Why do people fast? Why did the disciples, look at Luke chapter 5, what they said. Luke chapter 5. These people came. Verse 33. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but dying, they just eat and drink. They don't know any time to fast and pray. They eat and drink. And Christ had to tell them, Don't worry. As, as long as I'm here, it is feasting time. But when I'm gone, they will fast. But for today, power is here. I am here. They don't need to fast. Things can happen. Why is it that the disciples of John the Baptist, they fast often and they make prayers often? Why is it that the disciples of the Pharisees, they fast often and they eat, I mean, and, and they make prayers often? No, fasting and prayer brings a, a form of sanctification. Devotion, doing your quiet time every day, it, it has a, a kind of a you know an influence, a, a kind of sanctifying impact upon your life. You're reading the word, you are God is speaking unto you, it, it, it keeps you fresh, 
in your Christian life. There's a sanctifying influence that comes through devotional strategies. In uh, Psalm 27, Psalm 27, see what the Bible says in verse 8. Psalm 27, verse 8. When thou said, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And if you do that, you'll be close to God. You remember what Solomon said, if my people, if my people shall seek my face, shall turn from their evil ways, I will hear from heaven, I will heal their land, I will visit them. It has some. And if you read church history, there are some people also that believes in sanctification through this kind of devotional strategies. And you have saints of old, like David Brainerd. They prayed a lot. And when you read their writings, you, you see a closeness to God, a sanctification through much prayer, much fasting. People like the praying height, John Hyde, people like E.M. Bounds, they've experienced this kind of sanctification, a kind of closeness to God as a result of just fasting and praying and a lot of devotion from, to God. Now take a believer that puts number one, does that, adds it to number two, and adds it to number three, already has gone far. He has left a lot of believers, you know, in fact, when you look at him, you think he's an angel. And we have not gotten to the ultimate. But already, sanctification, you know, has started. Separation has started from the world. Closeness with God has started. And, and this, is, this is it. But again, sanctification through devotional strategies is sanctification, but it's only a part of the story. It's not a full story. You can benefit from all of them. But it's not a full story. And there are some people, that's what they do. That's why some people, they fast and pray, they fast and pray, they fast and pray. They live a fasted life every single time. Just fast and pray. It subdues the flesh. It makes the spirit to come alive. Your decisions will be decisions of the spirit because the body is subjected. The fasting and the praying subdues the carnality of the flesh and makes the spirit to be more active. It's a kind of sanctification that comes. It's sanctification through devotional strategies. But again, it's not the whole story. Amen. Amen. I'm sure that today you are understanding this topic much more. Many of us have understood it in bits and pieces. Our understanding has not been as complete as it ought to be. But today, you are getting a complete understanding today. Now, let's look at the last point. Sanctification through divine surgery. It's also sanctification. Now, what is the difference between number one, number two, number three, and number four? Number one, sanctification through devouring scriptures. That's what you do. God doesn't read the Bible for you. You read the Bible. God doesn't study the Bible for you. You study the Bible. You, God is going to hear the word. You are clean through the words that I speak unto you. You have to hear the word. Then, sanctification occurs. It's what man does. Sanctification through deliberate separation, that's what you do. Don't touch dead body. Don't drink strong wine. Don't abstain from fornication. That's what you do. And there's a sanctification that comes like that through deliberate separation. Sanctification through devotional strategies, that's what you do. You fast. You pray. You wait upon God. And you experience some sort of sanctification as a result of that. So that sanctification that comes from human effort and is still sanctification, and that happens. But also the sanctification that comes from divine effort. And that's the last one. And we need all of them. We need, what did I say? All of them. Don't be like believers that they practice number one only. And they will still express some sort of sanctification. Don't be like believers that practice number two only. And they will still express some sort of sanctification. Don't be like believers that practice number three only. All the four, you can benefit from them. And the fourth one is sanctification through divine surgery. Experience sanctification 
through deliberate separation, through devouring scriptures, through devotional strategies are good, but they, this origin originate from man. They originate from what we do. However, the ultimate and indispensable in sanctification is that which God does, the invisible surgery in our hearts. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Mm. I read from verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. First sanctification through deliberate separation. Then verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That's the occasion coming from God himself, not from man. And, your, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body preserve blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a sanctification that comes through God, through divine surgery where God takes your inward heart and operates it. And we're going to read some of it. In the house of Cornelius, Peter said, God put no difference between the Gentiles and the Jews, purifying their hearts by faith. That's not what Cornelius did. That's not what the household of Cornelius did. God did that in their heart. He purified their heart by faith. The divine surgery, as you, as you read the scriptures, is called, you know, circumcision. It is the ultimate. It is the indispensable in sanctification. I mean, in sanctification. It is what God does. The inward surgery in our heart. God himself takes that heart and operates it. Let's read in the scriptures. In Deuteronomy, Chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I want you to, to read. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I read from verse 12. It says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him? and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his status, which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. The earth also, with all that therein is, only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff naked. How do you circumcise the foreskin of your heart? You see? And he says, when you circumcise the foreskin of your heart, you will no longer be stiff naked. That's part of the surgery that God does. What is circumcision? Circumcision is a removal of the foreskin. When a male is circumcised, the extra flesh that covers the private part of the male is cut off. That's the foreskin, and you remove it. Circumcision is a remover. And what is God removing? That excess flesh that is useless, that is not needed, that flabby flesh that is not needed is removed. Here also, when somebody's heart is stiff naked, God says that is not necessary in that place. God does a surgery on the heart and removes that stiff nakedness. That's a concession. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. It says, And the Lord thy God will do what? Circumcise thy heart. Circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed. When God does that, what will happen? Oh, when to God love the Lord thy God, God with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. When God removes the stiff nakedness out of your life and he removes 
the rebellion from the heart, it's easy to serve God. It's easy to love God. It removes the excess flesh, the false skin that is not needed. You can. And that's what he said. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy sin to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest please. That's a concession done by God himself. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. I read from verse 25. Ezekiel 26, 36 from verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. That's salvation. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Idols are outside. And when God cleanses you from idolatry, that's removal of physical physical outward sins. Idolatry, buying down to an idol, worshiping. God said, I will remove all that from you. Verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. How does God give you a new heart? And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. God says that stubborn spirit. That when God says, do this, say, God, you know I love you, but this one you are telling me, I can't do it all. God says, that stubborn spirit, I will remove it. Yes. Says Tony Hart. Mm -hmm. And I will put in place of it a heart of flesh, soft. When God says, this is my will, say, yes, O oh Lord, I come to do your will. I submit. You do the will of God willingly without anybody cajoling you and without anybody having to be, you know, uh, persuading you and do no, you just do the will of God, heart of flesh. So here, verse 36 says, uh, verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. You can't do that by yourself. That's God. God said, Israel, this is what I'm going to do for you. And a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you I cause you to walk in my status, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. That's, that's sanctification. Divine surgery is a practical work in the heart. You can't do that yourself. God does that. But it's also sanctification. That's sanctification through divine surgery. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made how? Made how? Without hands. Without hands. You see that? The circumcision, when we take our, our boys and we circumcise them, it's a circumcision. But that's a circumcision made with hands. The circumcision in the heart, you can't do it with human hands. It's a circumcision made without hands. It's made with the hands of God, invisible. In verse 11, in who also he has circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What are you doing? The Adamic nature is being cut off. That's what he's talking about. That's the circumcision of the heart. And only God can do that. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verse 25. Romans chapter 2. Verse 25. For circumcision verily profited, if thou keep the law, at least those who are doing the circumcision of Abraham that God gave to him in Genesis chapter 17, see, it's profitable. The circumcision is an evidence you belong to God. But if you are not keeping the law, that circumcision is useless. You don't belong to God. If it's a physical token that I belong to God, 
That's what God gave to Abraham. But now if you are not keeping the law of God and you are not living for him, what is that circumcision signify? It signifies nothing. That's why Paul here is writing, for circumcision verily profited, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, the circumcision is made on circumcision, is worthless. Verse 26, therefore, if the circumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not the circumcision be counted for circumcision? Say you now see a Gentile who doesn't circumcise, who has not received the circumcision of Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, but is living right. In fact, it's better. He doesn't have physical circumcision, but he's keeping the law. You have physical circumcision, but you're not keeping the law. He says, shall not this one be counted as the one that is following God? Verse 27. And shall not our circumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfills the law, judge you, who by letter and circumcision does transgress the law. Now verse 28. For he is a Jew. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. You know how the Jews know that they are, say, well, I'm circumcised of the stock of Abraham. And Paul now said, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Verse 29, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Their circumcision is not the one that came from devotional strategies. No, it's the one that came from God. The circumcision is not the one that is coming from deliberate separation. Even though that one is important, this And that's important. The sanctification that comes from God, sanctification through divine surgery. So in this church, by the grace of God, we must understand all the four and we must profit from all the four. It is not take number four and leave the other three. All of them are important. All of them are in the scriptures and all of them are part. There is a kind of sanctification that you do that God doesn't do for you. When Joshua told the children of Israel, sanctify yourselves, he's not talking about the sanctification that is staying you. There is a responsibility. Separate yourself from every defiling influence. God said, the Lord that God walketh in the midst of you, therefore shall your camp be holy, that he sees no unclean thing in you. Separate from every evil so that he can do wonders among you. That's important. That's a separation. That's what they have to do. So there's a sanctification that comes from the human side and it's still sanctification, but it's not sufficient. Then there's the ultimate sanctification that comes from God as a result of hunger after that sanctification, after heart circumcision, hunger that I want to be pure like God. You are hungry after righteousness and you consecrate yourself and then you move by faith and believe God. Then God sanctifies your heart by faith. He performs that circumcision of the heart. He performs that spiritual surgery in your heart. He takes away the stiff nakedness and the rebellious heart. He takes away that subtle kind of, you know, a kind of reaction against God's commandment. He takes it away from your heart. The pastor doesn't see it, but God sees it. Let me give you an example. There's a particular boy, very stubborn, very rebellious, and then the father also, like a disciplinarian, the father will beat him like, of course, we should not be beating our children. That's child abuse. That's, you know, that's not, there's a way to correct children in the nice way. But I'm just talking about, this is a story. And because the boy does not want the beating many times. So when the father says, you know me, you know what I can do. I tell you, sit down there. The boy will sit down. But inside him, he said, but I'm standing up. Do you understand me? He will sit down physically so that the father sees. But inside him, he will be telling the father, but I'm standing up. The father would not see that. That's rebellion. And many times in the life of the believer, that's what is, that actually is what happens. You are doing that thing physically, mm. but your spirit resents it. Say, but if I don't do it now, they will say I'm backsliding. 
they will say, what kind of Christian I am? So you do it, but not willingly from your heart. You pay your tithe, but you're saying if it's not because brethren will talk, even this one, I could have used it to buy turkey for my family. Mm -hmm. It's an evidence of an unsanctified heart. And it's only God that can that sees that one and can remove it. That's what we are talking about. Correct action or wrong motive, wrong reaction in the heart. Man doesn't see that. Man will praise you for the correct action, but God says, I reject that action because the motive is wrong. And it's only God that can see that. And that's what sanctification through divine surgery does. He cleanses and removes, cut off that stiff nakedness, cuts off that reaction, cuts off all those things that rebel against God in a subtle way, cuts off all those things. You are able to serve God from the deep within your heart without any reservation. The action you are doing and the way you feel in your heart, they are just equal. Not that you are doing something so that brethren will not say that you are backsliding. But inside your heart, if you were left by yourself, you would have wanted to do something else. What kind of action is that? It's, it shows if you are saved, you are not sanctified. That's what it shows. But only God will know that. I won't know that because I will only see the, the action. I look at what, look at what uh, Ananias and Safira did. Everybody would have been praising them. If it were not that God revealed it to Peter, that these people, they said they sold their house and they brought the money so that they can share with the believers. But look at their heart. And Peter had to say, why are you lying to the Holy Ghost? I mean, what kind of a heart do you have? Something is happening in the heart, but they are doing what we would have seen as correct action. Their own went beyond even not being sanctified. This one is a complete deception that God says no. These ones are not even born again. They are not worthy to live. Let me just take them away. So we need to understand sanctification from all these angles. They are sanctification. But don't hold on to one to the exception of the others. All the four are necessary. All the four are required from the scriptures. All the four, you can benefit from them. If you are somebody you do your quiet time every day. There is a measure of sanctification that you experience, a closeness to God, a yielding to the Almighty that comes as a result of just constant doing your devotion every morning. You are, you are, you are just in tune with God. You fast, you pray, there's a closeness. Many saints of old, they've experienced that. Sanctification through deliberate separation separation from every kind of worldliness and the things that can defile you. And it's sanctification. And sanctification through devouring scriptures. You are reading the word. You are clean through the word that has spoken unto you. You are reading the word. The water of the word will cleanse you and make you, you know, feel more close to God. But all those are important, but they are not sufficient. You must still go for the one that only God can do. Do the one you can do that the scripture has said you must do. Do the separation that God has said you should separate. You know, many times that's what happens. You know, when people react against Christian dressing, it's an evidence of an unsanctified heart most of the time. Most of the time. It's the evidence of an unsanctified heart. You can't dress the way God wants you to dress. How will my sisters to look at me? How will my, what will my family say? What will my husband say? Uh, would my wife say that uh, my own is becoming too much? You are always thinking about what people will say. You never think about how God will, what God will say and how you will feel. It's the evidence of an unsanctified heart. When you are sanctified, the first thing you want to do is to please God. If men are pleased in the process, praise God. If men are not pleased in the process, you can't help it. But your ultimate goal, your first goal is to please your father. You want to do what he wants. And let me tell you, if you always want to do what God wants, men are not always going to be, to be happy about it. Amen? Amen. Amen. You're hearing me? Yes. yes sir. Okay. 
I don't know what has happened to the something, but don't worry. So even if men don't like you, and many times they're not going to like you because the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity with God. Most men are carnal. So when God tells you to do things, they're not going to like it because it's contrary to their carnal nature. So, but when you are sanctified, the first thing is you just want to please God. If men are pleased in the process, praise God. If they are not, that's their business. That's their thing. A sanctified believer finds it easy to do that. And I, I know that today you want to be like that. You want to pray and say, God, I have not gotten to this level, but I need to get to this level. This is what the Bible talks about, the believer sanctification. Where are you, my sister, in this thing we are talking about? Where are you, my brother, in this thing that we are talking about? God is calling you today, and he wants to help you. He wants to bless you. He wants you to be the best that you can, and I believe that you will be. Let's rise up and pray, and tell the Lord that he will help us. Let's rise up and pray. Oh, pray that you help us, oh God Almighty, my Lord and my God. Help us. Great and mighty God, we come to you today, Lord, that you will help us, Almighty Father. To help us. Help us, oh God Almighty. You're a great and mighty God. I will love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my spirit, all the days of my life, oh Lord. I want to love you, O Lord God Almighty, to the end, O Lord. Give me the grace, mighty and everlasting Father, to love you to the end, O Lord. To go to the end, O Lord. I pray thee for the grace, mighty Father. I pray thee, O ancient of days. Help me, mighty and everlasting Father. Lord, give me the grace. Lord, I pray for the grace. Lord, I pray for a divine ability. Let the Lord help you, my brother. Let the Lord help you, my sister. I come to you, Lord God Almighty, for a total circumcision Lord, of my heart. Oh Lord, my soul, my spirit. Lord God Almighty, to live for you all the days of our life, to walk with you. Lord. Let's pray that God will help us experience and from this. Lord, from Lord this I totally family. surrender all. To embrace you. all. I totally surrender and all. I totally lay all on the altar. To the ultimate. Pray, Lord, that you will help. Me. To through divine it's surgery. Totally for you. Where God removes it's the stone. Totally for you, oh Lord. Puts a heart of flesh. Oh. Where God removes the stiff nakedness, we live for you, Lord. The submissiveness, we for you, Lord God Almighty. I want to talk to you. This is what I want to do, and you do it without any kind of power, Lord. Any kind of reservation. Grant unto me, Lord Jesus, by your way, Lord, by your way, by your word, I've had today. Oh, precious Father, I separate myself unto you all the days of my life, O oh Lord. I separate myself unto you. Consecrate Lord, that you will use me, Lord, as a vessel unto you. Consecrate yourself unto me. Separate you. myself unto you. And come by faith today. Jesus, Lord, God I separate that. myself unto you, Holy Lord. Let God perform that. I separate myself unto you. Let, Let God use me, Lord, for your, your glory. Love your glory. Only for your glory. Only for your will. Your heart and put in oh my heart. Lord. Only for you, Lord. Only for you, Lord. Only for you, Lord. With all your soul, with all your mind, only for you, Lord. all your strength, only for you, Lord. Love him as my Lord. Lord. I pray, mighty Father. I want to live only for you. Only for your will. Only for your grace, only for you, Lord, all the days of my life. I want to, precious Lord, I want to live in Jesus' oh, mighty name. We pray. Lord, Amen. Amen. Brethren, when you get, I mean, when we finish, you still need to consider, look through the outline, you know, hear the message. 
go through the scriptures, you still need to pray more until God brings you to the ultimate that he sanctifies your heart through that divine surgery. He removes the stony heart out of your, out of your heart. You've heard a lot how to dress like a believer. But because of not being sanctified, you've not been able to do it. Every time your heart rebels against it, you have heard about tithing that this is the duty of the believer. But every time you argue about it, it's an evidence of an unsanctified heart. Maybe there is a way you relate with your wife. We have told you that if you're a real believer, you can't beat your wife. You can't speak to your wife anyhow and be just bullying that woman and abusing that woman. You say, eh, that, that's the way we do it in our family. Well, that's not the way it is done in God's family. Even if you are born again, it means that you are unsanctified. You are not ready to submit to how God says you should treat your wife as a weaker vessel. Treat them with understanding. Treat them with love. Treat them with consideration. Carry her precious. Carry her as heirs of the grace of life with you. Look after this woman. My brother, it's an evidence you are not sanctified. And you need to, to go to God and say, God, the way I treat my wife is an evidence that I'm not even sanctified. So that God can help you. You can be tender, you can be loving, you can be considerate. You can, you can treat her exactly the way God wants. I pray that today, God will help you to get to that experience in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we just thank you for today's service. We thank you for how you have expounded your word unto us so that we are not lopsided. Many people understand only part and bits and pieces of the sanctification experience, but you are open to us the totality of the experience so that we are not ignorant anymore, so that the devil will not be able to take advantage of us. We can be able to enter into the fullness of the blessing that God has in store for us. Oh Lord, I'm praying that as many as are consecrating their heart, as many as they are drawing nigh to you, as many as are thirsty and they are hungry after righteousness, today they will be filled in Jesus' name. As they come by faith to appropriate this experience of sanctification that comes from God, I pray that that divine surgery, it will happen in their heart. When husband is sanctified and wife is sanctified, there will be peace in the home. They can talk to themselves like reasonable believers. They can talk from love. They can talk out of compassion. There will not be all this rowdiness and shouting on one another. It will be gone because the character of Christ is fully born in their life. Oh Lord, I'm praying that even for the sake of you know living in the family, help every one of us to seek this experience in Jesus' name. Amen. So that your love and your peace can reign in our families in Jesus' name. Amen. All this kind of people obey you fully because the heart has reservation, because the heart is still sick, still has a, a, a measure of stiff nakedness, because the heart is still uh, to some extent stony. The Adamic nature is still resident inside it. Oh Lord, I pray when your spiritual surgery comes and you cut off that stony heart and you remove that, I mean, that stiff nakedness and you sanctify us and you circumcise our heart and you place inside it a heart that is flesh, a, a, a heart of flesh, soft, easy to entreat, a heart that willingly and voluntarily does the will of God without any force, without any coercion. Oh Lord, I'm praying that that kind of heart do the spiritual surgery in every heart of your children in Jesus' name. Amen. When we, when we are sanctified, we see, we see it in the church. The church will be peaceful. The church will be serene. The church will be loving. Every one of us will look after one another without any reservation. Oh, Lord, I pray, let this, your church, experience this sanctification and this circumcision of heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us be satisfied until we'll experience it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Because we know you've answered. Amen. Let your name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.